This lecture is part of an online course on complex analysis and will be about the via Streis elliptic functions. So I'll just recall um, a bit about elliptic functions. So last lecture we saw an elliptic function was one that was doubly periodic. So f plus m omega 1 plus n omega 2 equals f of z. Here omega 1 and omega 2 are the periods and m and n are integers. And we saw several properties. For instance, the number of zeros in a fundamental domain is equal to the number of poles. And the sum of all zeros in a fundamental domain is equal to the sum of the poles um, plus m omega 1 plus n omega 2 for some m and n. And um, we found elliptic functions can have at least three poles. And um, we can find them with three or four poles and so on. And um, we, we, we could find elliptic functions with at least three poles by taking sums over m and n of some rational function g of z plus m omega 1 plus n omega 2, where the degree of g is less than or equal to minus 3. And we needed this to make it converge. And this 3 comes from this minus 3. And um, they um, cannot have um, exactly one pole. So this leaves open the question, can they have two poles in a fundamental domain? And this is what we're going to answer this lecture. So let's try, um, first of all, if, if we want, say, a pole of order 3 at 0, we can just take sum over all m and n of 1 over z plus m omega 1 plus n omega 2 all cubed. So why can't we do this for the sum over all m and n of 1 over z plus m omega 1 plus n omega 2? all squared. Well, the problem is this does not converge. Well, actually, it does converge if you add it up in the right order. So let's say it doesn't converge absolutely. Because having the sum of something depend on the order you add it up in is a real pain. Um, so um, let's try. Well, well, it's it's very close to being convergent. So um, for large, for, 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 for near z, um, for, for smallish values of z, this, this term is approximately 1 over m omega 1 plus n omega 2 squared. And again, it's the sum of these that's, that, 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 that sort of diverges. So, so we can say this is the divergent bit. And in order to make the convergence better, we can just sort of subtract the divergent bit. And writing m omega 1 plus n omega 2 all the time is getting a pain. So I'm just going to write lambda equals m omega 1 plus n omega 2. And I'm going to write L for the set of all numbers of the form m omega 1 plus n omega 2. So L is, is the lattice that we're summing over. And then what we do is we take this sum over all lambda of 1 over z plus lambda squared. That, 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 that's just this thing written in the lambda notation. And then we're going to subtract 1 over lambda squared from it. Um, so the 1 over lambda squared is, is, is just this bit in slightly shorter notation. Um, and there's a slight problem here. What if lambda equals zero? Because then we notice that this term here is infinite. So what can we do about that? Well, that's quite easy to fix. What we do is we just um, take the sum over all lambda that aren't zero of one over um, z plus lambda squared minus one over lambda squared. And then we add in the term with lambda equals zero. And we don't add in this infinite constant when lambda is equal to zero. 
So um, let's see that this actually fixes the convergence because if we look at this bit here, we see that this is approximately minus c squared plus 2z lambda divided by z plus lambda squared times lambda squared. And now we notice this is sort of a degree um, minus 3 in lambda, roughly. So when lambda is very large, this, this is about 1 over lambda cubed, or maybe may, may some constant over lambda cubed. So it converges. converges absolutely. Um, so that's really nice because we've managed to turn um, our divergent series into a convergent one. So we define the Weierstrass p function as follows. It's just the sum over lambda not equal to zero of one over z plus lambda squared minus one over lambda squared and plus 1 over z squared. Um, well, there's a slight problem here. The terms uh, are not invariant under um, z goes to z plus lambda, or at least the sum of the terms isn't invariant, because if we didn't put this 1 over lambda squared in, um, this would be obviously invariant if we change z to z plus lambda, but it doesn't converge. If we put this lambda squared in, then it obviously converges, but it's no longer obviously invariant under z goes to z plus lambda. So, so we, we sort of seem to have um, a, a problem and we've moved the problem around, but how do we actually get rid of it? I mean, we can either make it convergent or we can make it invariant, but how on earth do we make it both convergent and invariant? Well, it turns out that this actually is invariant, even though it's, it's not quite obvious. And to see this, um, we can reason as follows. What we do is we look at the derivative of the p function. But by the way, this funny squiggly sign is actually a, a capital P. It, it, it's written in some strange script. And as far as I can figure out, the the entire alphabet, the script alphabet that Weierstrass was using has been lost to history except for the letter P, which sort of survives as this strange fossil because Weierstrass used it and everybody ever since then has been copying him. So, so in languages like tech, they, they, they have this script alphabet which you only have the letter P in it because it's needed for this function. Anyway, so the, the derivative is now equal to the sum over M so it's a sum over lambda of minus 2 times 1 over z plus lambda cubed. And now we notice that this is elliptic because um, these terms are obviously invariant if you change z to z plus something in, in, in the lattice lambda. There's a bit of a problem. If, if you if you are being really picky, you might have noticed that we're doing term by term differentiation. So we want to know is the derivative of a sum equal to the sum of a derivative? And in general this is a rather tricky question and it certainly isn't always true. Um, in complex analysis this is easy to prove. What you have to do is, um, well, th 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 there are some magic words you have to write down and the magic words are locally uniformly convergent. So you remember we discussed local uniform convergence and we said that if a series was locally uniformly convergent then, then absolutely everything wonderful happens to it. In particular you can differentiate term by term. Um, the other good thing about saying something is locally uniformly convergent is no one can ever quite remember the definition of it, so they'll probably um, give you a pass on whatever you want to claim for it. So why does local uniform convergence preserve sort of make preserve differentiation? Well, you remember if something is locally uniformly convergent, this means it preserves integration in that the integral of some sum is equal to the sum of an integral provided you're integrating over some finite path. Um, so how do we get from that to differentiation being preserved? Well, the answer is that the derivative 
um, sorry, d by dz of f is equal to some sort of integral over c of something which we don't really care about. And this is just the Cauchy integral formula. You remember we had Cauchy's integral formula for f and we had a sort of variation of it for the derivative of f. And um, so we can write derivatives in terms of integrals. And because local uniform convergence behaves very nicely with respect to integrals, it also behaves nicely with respect to derivatives. So this minor technical point doesn't really matter. Um, anyway, so what we've done is we've shown the derivative of p is elliptic. So p of z minus p of z plus omega 1 has derivative 0. So it is constant. So we can make it equal to some constant c. And what we, we, we now have the following problem. Is c equals 0? And um, in general, this is a slightly tricky question. But for the, for the Weierstrass function, we can, we can do this. Because we notice that the Weierstrass function is even. And this is obvious because all the terms in the sum defining it are even. And now let's just put z equals minus omega 1 over 2. So we find that p of minus omega 1 over 2 is equal to m minus p of omega 1 over 2 is equal to c. That, that's just this expression here. But now these are equal as p is even. So c equals 0. And of course, um, we also get p of z um, equals p of z plus omega 2 in exactly the same way. So p is uh, just elliptic. And it has a double pole at z equals 0. So it's got exactly um, two poles in a fundamental domain, although both these poles happen to be in exactly the same place. Um, now, you may be wondering a bit. Um, here, we've done this funny trick of renormalizing to get an elliptic function with a double pole, even though the series didn't quite converge. And you may say, why can't we do exactly the same to get an elliptic function with a single pole in the fundamental domain? So what we do is we would start off with sum of lambda in L, 1 over z minus lambda. And this is elliptic except that it does not converge. So let's just copy what we did for Weierstrass's p function, make this converge. So we notice that 1 over z minus lambda is equal to minus 1 over lambda minus z over lambda squared minus something over lambda cubed minus something over lambda to the 4 and so on. And um, we notice that this is degree less than or equal to minus 3 in lambda. So um, this bit will converge very nicely. So this, is, so, so this is the bad bit. So what we do is we just subtract off the bad bit. And we define a function to be sum over lambda in L of 1 over z minus lambda. And then we subtract off the bad bit. So we have plus 1 over lambda plus c over lambda squared. Um, and this is the zeta function. And you shouldn't confuse this with the Riemann zeta function. This is the Weierstrass zeta function, which has absolutely nothing to do with the Riemann zeta function and just confuses everybody. And there's a bit of a problem here because when lambda equals 0, this bit becomes infinite. So just as with the Weierstrass function, we, we just omit if lambda equals 0. And now um, this series is now absolutely convergent. Uh, 
and it converges uniformly on compact subsets provided we stay away from the, the poles here and so on. So it's as, as nice as you could possibly want. So we've actually got a function which has a single pole at z equals m omega 1 plus n omega 2 and no other poles. Um, now in the p function um, you remember it was sort of unclear whether or not what we got was elliptic and by doing this funny little argument using the fact that p was even we could show that this was actually elliptic. So let's try and do the same for the for the zeta function. So the first thing we do is take the derivative of the zeta function. So the derivative of the zeta function, um, well you see it's just equal to minus the Weierstrass function and this is elliptic. So that works okay. I mean that you can see this because you just differentiate term by term. And that's fine because we started by showing the derivative of the Weierstrass function was elliptic so that's really great. So just as before we can show that zeta, this shows that zeta of z plus omega 1 minus zeta of z is a constant. But th th this is just what we did for p for the p function. You remember we showed that p of z plus omega 1 minus p of z was some constant. And then the final step was to show that this constant is zero which we did by using the fact that p is even. So let's try and do this. Well the zeta function is odd. Zeta of minus c equals minus zeta of z. And the problem is this fails to show that the constant is, is zero. Um, so if, if we've got an even function satisfying this then we can show the constant is zero but it's perfectly consistent to have an odd function like this where the constant is non-zero and this is what goes wrong. So we find that zeta is sort of elliptic up to constants. In other words zeta of z plus m omega 1 plus n omega 2 equals zeta of z plus a constant and this depends on m and n and it's, it's, it's not zero in general. In fact it can't always be zero because if it were always zero then zeta would be an elliptic function with, with a single pole which we've just shown is impossible. Um, however we can still do some interesting things with zeta even though it's not elliptic because now look at this. Zeta of z minus a minus zeta of z minus b is elliptic because if we, if we add zeta of z plus lambda minus a minus zeta of z plus lambda minus b then these differ by a constant and these differ by the same constant so the constants cancel out when you subtract them. So we've managed to find an elliptic function and this has poles at a and b. So we can find elliptic poles with two with two poles in a fundamental domain at, at any two points we like by taking a difference of values of the zeta function. So, so the fact that it wasn't elliptic doesn't really matter too much. It's quite easy to, to build elliptic functions out of it. Um, by the way the construction of the zeta function, you remember we had zeta of z was the sum over lambda in lambda of 1 over z minus lambda plus 1 over lambda plus c over lambda squared is, is a special case of something called a mittag leffler series. So what we do is we take a, su a sort of, um, you can think of this, if we omit this it's like a sort of infinite partial fraction decomposition of a function if you ignore the fact that it doesn't converge. And we can make it converge by adding little fudge factors to the partial fractions to make them very small when, when z is reasonably small. And you can do this with, with any formal infinite sequence of partial fractions. We can have any sum of the form 1 over z minus um, a i to the n i provided the a i tend to infinity. And by adding fudge factors 
you can make you can make this converge uniformly on compact subsets, and this the, the, this is called a Mittag-Leffler series. So this this is a simple case of it used to construct elliptic functions. Um, well, so what can we do with elliptic functions? Well, there are amazing numbers of identities between them, and the key point is any elliptic function with no poles is constant. You remember this was followed immediately from Liouville's theorem, and this means we can construct lots of identities by cancelling out all the poles. So, so, so let's have a simple example. Um, we know that the derivative of the Weierstrass function is um, um, given by um, minus uh, Actually, let's start by just having the Weierstrass function. So this is equal to 1 over z squared plus something times z squared plus higher terms. So the derivative of the Weierstrass function is equal to um, minus 2z to the minus 3 plus something times z plus higher terms. So, so this is a pole of order 3 at 0 and this is a pole of order 2 at 0. And now we can cancel out these poles as follows. First of all, we take the square of the derivative of the Weierstrass function. So this is going to be 4z to the minus 6 plus something times, or well, we've got a z to the minus 2 plus higher powers. And the cube of the Weierstrass function is equal to z to the minus 6, sorry, z to the minus, yes, z to the minus 6 plus something, uh, z to the minus 2 plus whatever. So if we take the derivative of the Weierstrass function squared minus the Weierstrass function cubed, this is going to be something times z to the minus 2 plus something plus higher powers. OK, well, we've no idea what these somethings are, but we can now take this squared minus this cubed, and now we can subtract something times p of z in order to cancel out this term. And this will be something plus higher powers. And then we can move the constant to the other side. So minus a constant is equal to um, z squared, something times z squared and so on. And now this is an elliptic function with no poles. And it vanishes at naught, so it must be zero. <coughs> so we found an elliptic function that's zero, and this gives us a non-trivial differential equation. Square of the derivative of the Weierstrass function is equal to 4 times its cube minus some constant times um, Weierstrass z minus some other constant. So this is the famous differential equation for the Weierstrass function. You notice it's a highly non-linear differential equation. It's got a square there and a cube there. And this is just the beginning of a huge number of identities between elliptic functions. So I'll just show you a few of them. This is from the book um, Modern Analysis by Whitaker and Watson. Modern means it was sort of written in the early 20th century because modern was a kind of cool word back then. And here are the exercises at the end, and you can see here's an identity for the Weierstrass function, here's another, and um, their exercises go on for pages and pages. There, there, there are all these endless exercises for this function. You can prove nearly all of them just by using the fact that two elliptic functions um, are um, the same if they have the same poles and zeros. So here's another rather scary looking example. And the scariest thing of it all is, is this thing at the bottom. Um, this stands for mathematical tripods. What this means is that this question was set as an examination question for undergraduates. Um, so, you know, a century ago, undergraduates at Cambridge were expected to be able to prove identities like this on site during, during an exam. OK, so next lecture, we'll be doing a little bit more about elliptic functions and, in fact, classifying all elliptic functions in three different ways. <laughs>